Okay, um, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Wallum, I'm ALBA's Executive Director. And on behalf of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, I wanna welcome all of you for being here with us today. ALBA is very pleased to be sponsoring this event. And I want to begin with a big thank you to Carol Nagar for being with us and sharing her fascinating insights and perspectives on David Shim Seymour. Sebastian, our chair, will introduce her in just a minute, but we, want, we just wanted to, at this point, give her a big thank you. Alba's mission is to preserve the legacy of the volunteers who fought fascism in Spain. If you are joining our events for the first time, be sure to check out our website for more information. You'll find links to our website in the chat, and also be sure to sign up to receive our quarterly publication, The Volunteer. <clears throat> ALBA is pleased to offer our programs free of charge, but of course this is only possible through the generosity of our donors. Please do consider making a donation at the links which you can also find in the chat. A couple of housekeeping matters before we begin. This event will be recorded. If you prefer not to be seen, please turn your, off your camera. On a related note, we do love seeing you, but if you do choose to get up and move around your room or office during the event, we'd ask that you turn your camera off as sometimes the movement can be distracting. There will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. So you can start thinking about your questions now and we'll soon invite you to put them in the chat. Um, on, uh, in that vein, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Dennis Meany, executive assistant at ALBA, who's providing the tech support for uh, this event and who will be fielding your questions. Thank you, Dennis. And with that, I'd like to introduce and thank the chair of our board, Sebastian Faber. Many of you are familiar with Sebastian. He serves in many capacities at ALBA, including co-editor of The Volunteer, and is one of our primary facilitators of our ever popular teaching institutes, institutes, with, institutes which have provided countless teachers in the US and elsewhere with the necessary tools to teach the history of the Spanish Civil War and the heroic anti-fascist efforts of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Sebastian's most recent book is entitled Exhuming Franco, which is highly recommended reading. So with that, with a welcome to all of you and a thanks to everyone who's participating, I'll turn it over to Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you, Dennis, for running behind the scenes as usual. And thank you, Carol, for, for being here with us from Paris. Sure, sure. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure. It was a great pleasure to read your book. Um, I, I thought it'd be interesting for the, just to give the, uh, our, our conversation a little bit more um, uh, anchor to start with a brief six minute introduction into Shim's life and work. So everybody has his images on their, um, in, in their mind as we, we start talking about him as a photographer. I was thinking like when you talk about photography, you have to show images. Um, so I'll, I'll start with that and then I'll properly introduce Carol and then um, my plan is to, to talk with her, have a conversation with her about 25 minutes or so, and then open it up for questions. So we have 25 to 30 minutes left for questions. We hope to close, to not keep you too long uh, on the hour or maybe five or 10 minutes after. Um, so thanks again. It's great to see you all here and I'll get started with my brief introduction. In late September 1948, the photographer David Shimon wandered through the Warsaw neighborhood where he'd been born 37 years earlier when Poland was still a province of Tsarist Russia and where he'd lived for most of the first 21 years of his life. Yet judging by the photographs he took, neighborhood is too generous a description. After the German occupation, the street where he'd grown up, grown up had become part of the Jewish ghetto and was then raised in response to the 1944 uprising. Four years later, the images show a desert of debris as far as the eye can see with some rudimentary roads running through the piles. All the buildings have been completely wiped out, blown up by dynamite, Shimon wrote in the caption, and the streets are completely covered with rubble. A few main thoroughfares have been cleaned. The only two structures left standing were the church and the school. 
Next, Jimin took the train to Adwak, a resort town 15 miles to the southeast, where his family would spend their summers and where his parents had co-owned a small bed and breakfast. Throughout the war, David and his sister had hoped and prayed that their parents might have survived the Holocaust, but it turned out that they, along with his mother's sister, had been shot by the Nazis in Odwalk in August 1942. Six years later, Shimon was surprised to find that his parents' bed and breakfast was still there, turned into an orphanage for war victims. But while he had his camera on him, and in fact was an assignment to, for UNICEF to document the lives of children in post-war Europe, he did not take a single picture. Sometimes the absence of an image is just as telling as its presence, Carol Nagar writes in her biography of Shem. And trauma can only express itself in silence. A lot had changed since 1932 when David had left for Paris to study at the Sorbonne. For one, he now carried an American passport that identified him as David Seymour, although his friends had long known him as Shim. In Paris, he connected with fellow anti-fascists, became a photojournalist, and enthusiastically documented the rise of the Popular Front. He first traveled to Spain in early 1936, months before a failed military coup would unleash a civil war. Shim's photographic coverage of that war would make him world famous, as it did his friends Gerda Taro and Robert Kappa, like him, young progressive Jewish refugees of fascism. Gerd, as we know, tied crushed by a tank in 1937. In 1939, Shim accompanied Spanish exiles on a boat to Mexico, and he then immigrated to the United States, served in the US Army as a photographic analyst during World War II, and traveled through post-war Europe to document the damage done and attempts at reconstruction. Born into a well-to-do Polish Jewish family, Shim had grown up surrounded by high culture. His father, a prominent publisher of books in Yiddish and Hebrew, took the family to Odessa when the Great War broke out, returning to Warsaw in 1919. 10 years later, in 29, Shim went to Leipzig to study graphic arts, Bauhaus was all the rage, and then moved to Paris to study chemistry and physics, knowledge to be applied to his professional future as a printer. Instead, he got drawn into photography. In 1947, two years after the war, Kappa and Shim, together with George Roger and Henri Cartier-Bresson, founded Magnum, a groundbreaking cooperative that sought to empower photojournalists in their relationships to editors and publishers by allowing them to retain copyright, to receive proper compensation, and to protect the integrity of their images and captions. Over the next seven years, Magnum grew into what it is today, one of the world's premier agencies and a force for progressive innovation. Yet photojournalism is a dangerous profession. And in the mid fifties, Magnum suffered three heavy losses. Kappa died in May 54 on assignment in Indochina when he stepped on a landmine. Nine days earlier, Werner Bischoff had dropped, had dropped to his death off a cliff in Peru. Two and a half years later, while covering the Suez crisis, Shim and a colleague were killed by Egyptian soldiers while driving their jeep along the canal. Although he was not yet 45, Shim left an impressive photojournalistic oeuvre that included everything from wars and refugee crises to labor protests, post-war reconstruction efforts, folk rituals, and celebrity portraits. From the outset, sorry, um, from the outset, two threads ran through his work. Sheer technical ability, as you can see, Shim had an uncanny sense for photographic composition and a deep empathy for his subjects, especially women and children. I'll show you a couple of the pictures from, uh, these are all in Carol's book. This one is on the cover of one of his uh, UNESCO children's books.
No one knows more about David Seymour than historian and curator Carol Nagar, who has studied his life and work for decades. Her long-awaited biography, handsomely edited by De Gruyter, provides a detailed, near exhaustive overview of Seymour's four and a half decades on this earth, primarily guided starting in the 30s by his contact sheets and publications. I'll just close this now. Carol Nagar is a poet, photography, historian, curator, and painter. She's a regular contributor to uh, Aperture and Time Lightbox. And since 2014, she's been series editor for the Magnum Photos Legacy Biography series. She's written biographies of uh, other photographers as well, including George Roger and Werner Bischoff. She was the co-founder and special projects editor of Pixel Press from 1999 to 2006. She was born in Egypt, but she currently splits her time between New York and Paris from where she is now speaking with us. And we're very happy to have you here. Welcome to this event. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll start off with, with, the, with the kind of biographical question for you. Could you remember the first time you saw a photograph by Shim? Uh, I think it was uh, in the in the 1980s uh, in Paris, I saw his pictures of Tereshka. And uh, at the time, there was an, in, uh, an interpretation that Tereshka was a survivor of a concentration camp. But it was later demonstrated that, in fact, she was a, from, a, from a Catholic family and uh, she had never been in a concentration camp. Uh, so uh, that, that was my first exposure. It was a very striking picture. Uh, you may have seen it. It's a little girl in front of a blackboard. The teacher has asked, the children to draw a home. Uh, it's 1948, uh, it's in a school for children traumatized by war. And this girl uh, is not like the other uh, children in the room. The others are uh, drawing ideal scenes with uh, these houses with a red roof and a chimney and a sun and the mother preparing meals. But all Tereshka can draw uh, is a scribble. It's a kind of maelstrom of, uh, of lines, and it is as if for her, uh, war has never ended. And of course, she suffered from what was called then shell shock, and we call now PTSD, but people didn't know how to deal with it uh, or even what it was. So it, it, she spent yeah. most of the time in a psychiatric hospital. So this 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 image of the, of the girl on the blackboard is 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 kind of an iconic shim image. Um, it's yeah. on the cover of some of his of his collections. Um, those of us who work on the Spanish Civil War are used to sort of clump shim together with Robert Capa and Gerda Taro, um, and and their pictures have actually been confused with each other, right? They've been misattributed. Well, absolutely. Uh, I mean, attributions always go to the more famous person. Uh, in that case, Capa. I even had this, this experience a few just a few years before the so-called Mexican suitcase was uh, rediscovered. I was in um, in uh, Belgium, in Brussels, at the Jewish Museum. It was a Kappa retrospective, and the image on the poster was Shim. It was by Shim. It was a little boy uh, of the a little Republican boy with the with the hat of the uh, the Union of the Metal Workers or something like that. Right, right. So, as a curator, um, how would you say Shim's work? Differs from that of Kappa and Taro. Can you can you can you see this is this is typical Shim? This is typical Kappa, or is that? Uh, I think the, 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 lines are, the lines are a little more blurred than that. For instance, it has been said that Shim uh, did not photograph action, but in fact he did. Uh, in the Spanish Civil War, he sometimes was very close to action, especially the dinamiteros who uh, who used to uh, make these homemade. Uh, uh, bombs and light them with their lighter and then throw it. He was very close. Uh, but in fact, I think in general, he's somebody who is more, um, who likes to see the periphery. Mm -hmm. He likes to go for maybe the more obscure. Uh, for instance, his picture of a, this amazing picture of uh, the, um, the typewriter. I, I'll try to find it in the book and uh, Maybe you will uh, be able to show it. Hold on. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, 
it, it's uh, it's all the way at the end, I think. Uh, yes, it's a page of. I found it. And, uh, 65, the typewriter. Yes, I think only Shim could have done a picture like that. Uh, and it's really interesting because the typewriter was something he was uh, emotionally very linked to. Uh, he wrote most of the text and the captions of his own pictures, which is also something that Kappa would not do. I would say that Kappa's photographs are more slashes of the instant and that uh, Shim is a more composed, self-critical person than Kappa is. He's not an action. Uh, Kappa used to say that he was just a hack and Shim was the, the really good photographer. As for Taro, I don't know her work as well, but I think she actually uh, did a lot more in your face images mm -hmm. than Shim or Kappa did, for instance. Uh, the obvious example is the dead children that she photographed in the morgue. She just went and photographed one child after, after the other. These were incredible, mm -hmm. uh, these images. They were really like uh, fists in your face. Um, Shim did not, that I know of, photograph one dead body. Uh, even though he covered uh, both uh, the Spanish Civil War and the, and the Suez War in 1956. So, uh, but I think they complemented each other. Uh, it's really interesting to see how three people who have the same or similar political convictions were in the same places, though not at the same time, not to double each other's work, really created three different bodies of work. Uh, but they, they knew and appreciated each other very much. With, with Shim, looking through the Mexican suitcase, especially, I sometimes have the impression that I can imagine him wandering around, like unnoticed, like there's something going on. He's just uh, hobbles around until he found, finds kind of a corner or sometimes from above or from yes. below. And he shoots these sort of like unexpected angles to, to oh, take. Yeah, absolutely. What, what you're saying makes me think of his... Uh, photograph of the mass in the in the Basque uh, because he wanted to show to the French public that Republicans were not the uh, the, the church bashers that had been presented uh, by the Franquists, but they were they could be also religious. So he photographed that mass at the front and he did these he, he walked around, he photographed from above, from below. It's almost as a film. And he photographed also a still life with a, uh, the, what the priest would be using for the Eucharist. Uh, and also when he photographed that uh, very well-known image of the woman listening to the socialist uh, speaking, he first, he was uh, standing next to the, to the speaker. Then he went down and he uh, almost did casting. Uh, he looked at all the faces and he found somebody that was interesting to him and he focused on her. I'm going to try to find that picture in the book also, uh, probably at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War uh, chapter, The Good Cause. Yeah, I got it here. You got it? It's, it's a, a, figure seven. Uh, you mean the one where she's looking up, right? She's looking up. Yes. Yeah, I, I got it here. One second. Sorry, one second. And uh, what's uh, really interesting about that image is that before the, the Mexican suitcase, it had never been seen uh, as a complete image. It was always recropped to create a sort of Madonna and child image, much more uh, generic, I would mm -hmm. say. Yeah. And it has also been used on a propaganda book called Madrid uh, in 1937. And it was photo montaged with um, uh, bombs falling from the sky so that her expression, instead of being the rapt uh, attention to a speaker, became fear looking at the sky. So uh, all these images have all these, uh, these stories around them about how they, they have been used out of context and, and uh, reused. 
But uh, uh, Magnum was was basically selling that image as a close up, as if uh, Shim had had a, a long lens that he never possessed. Maybe yeah. he had only a thirty five and a fifty millimeter, and uh, sometimes a Rolleiflex. So, so there's a, a a fair amount of reconstruction and correction that you have had to do as a biographer. But what kind of cha other other challenges that you run into trying to write the life? of somebody who died at 45 in the mid fifties and had traveled around a lot. What, what kind of obstacles did you encounter in well, this? It's um, uh, First of all, I must uh, pay homage to Richard Whelan uh, uh, through whom I met Shim's family. But when I started that job, uh, that when I met Ben Schneiderman, who is uh, Shim's nephew in 2005, uh, he said, oh, okay, oh, you come to Washington and see my archive. I looked at his archive and there was almost nothing. There was maybe a few uh, a few prints, a couple of press cards, uh, one camera, and that's it. And I told him, I cannot do this. Uh, is, isn't there anything else? He says, no, I don't think so. So I said, no, uh, I can't do it. And then uh, very strangely on the day, uh, there was a memorial for Cornel Kappa, who is the founder of ICP in New York. Uh, ben arrived uh, beaming with a big box, and in that box was a huge dossier that he found that had been compiled by his mother, Eileen Schnellman, uh, Shim's sister. And it turned out that they were moving, and he opened a, uh, a closet, and all the way back at the end of this closet was that box. So then I looked at him and I said, I can start my job now. Uh, and that was uh, several years after. Uh, so I, I thought this was dead in the water. And then the Mexican suitcase again uh, gave uh, more, uh, you know, it let us uh, identify which images were by Shim, which by Kappa and which by Taro, and also Fred Stein. No, let's not forget Fred Stein. And so that was another occasion. And then in a chicken farm in New Jersey, a few years back, uh, a bunch of uh, color slides were found. A lot of them were from the project we went back that he did in 1947. So it's uh, like an archive is something that's always growing and it's always reconstructed and uh, it's a living body. It's not something that's fixed. And that's what's fascinating about the job I'm trying to do. You, in, in your um, biography, you describe Shim as as kind of shy and very reserved and discreet about his personal life. And you, you, you speculate a little bit about his love life and his romantic attachments. But you basically say he, he never shared much with anybody, whereas Kappa, for example, was very flamboyantly open with his oh, oh, wild yeah, romantic conquests. But at the uh, same time, you, you... he was a, a strange, very quirky guy. He comp uh, compartmentalized a lot. Uh, uh, however, when after he died, uh, Katia Bresson said he had to visit all of Shim's girlfriends. So there must have been several, uh, I assume, because he usually uh, didn't lie about that stuff. I, I also think that Shim's uh, sister um, sanitized the archive. Uh, oh. She. Uh, she looked at all the uh, the material, and she only left uh, three letters from a theater student who seemed uh, extremely passionate, uh, as if it was a first experience for her, and a, a letter by Irene Papas, who was a, uh, a Greek uh, actress and model, who was one of the the. Um, the stars, the starlets, rather, that uh, Shin frequented in uh, Chinechita, which was called uh, Hollywood on the Tiber. It was the cheapest alternative to making films in the 1950s when he moved to Rome. So he did share a little bit with Kappa, the moving from wars to jet set or from wars to the glamour of, yes. of Hollywood and, and, and movie making. Um, and it is through uh, Kappa uh, that he met Ingrid Bergman. Okay. And Ingrid is the one who opened doors for him in uh, Cinecita. So he photographed Rossellini. He was the first person who was admitted to her private life, to her family life, to the birth of her children. Uh, you know, it was a big scandal because they were both still married uh, when they started their affair. 
this is Catholic Italy in the 1950s and so on and so forth. So through uh, Bergman then he moved on to Sophia Loren, to uh, Gina Lolo Brigida, to uh, Audrey Hepburn, who was one of his- These favorite. are all people he photographs. He didn't have romantic attachments to them, right? You're saying? Well, I, I, I kind of speculate that uh, they, they did a lot of dressing and undressing for him and they seem pretty much at ease. Uh, so either he's a genius or he must have had a few affairs on the way. Yeah, I imagine so. You, you also make clear, and, and his images make clear, that he had an, an uncanny ability to connect with his subjects in a very, like in an instant. Yeah, th this it's one of his uh, paradoxes. He was shy, but he also... Uh, he could make himself invisible. Like for instance, when he's this, in that classroom in Naples, where he circulates between the the um, the people in the classroom, and the, each of them seems to feel recognized. He, he, it's like he can connect with uh, people from very different social classes, uh, which is really uh, astonishing. Uh, and in other, in uh, you know, he photographs popes, he photographs starlets, but he also photographs a lot of workers. Uh, for instance, his portraits of the uh, the workers in uh, after the war in Germany are are, are amazing. Uh, these are people who who are obliged to destroy their own means of production, like the in the Krupp factory. And you could see that even though the Nazis have uh, demolished and destroyed his family, he still uh, can connect with these people and feel empathy uh, from man to man or also with old people and with children, he was very good. He, he spoke many languages, right? He spoke seven languages, yeah. Uh, uh, his friend uh, Judy uh, Friedberg says that he soon added uh, uh, incorrect English to the clutch of languages that he mastered. <laughs> yeah, he, he was not very grammatical. <laughs> But he but, managed to, to write all his captions uh, and all of the text for his. Uh, so he was very literate in that sense. If and then, as, as, as a so we have this image. He's, he's a very careful photographer. He is a very human, humanly very warm. Can connect with people. He he has an active romantic life, um, and then, as as founder of Magnum uh, of the agency. You describe a couple of moments in the history of the agency of, of crisis where she really steps in and kind of like takes the helm yeah. and 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 gets things back in order and 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 sort of like herds all these this group of photographers into a particular direction yeah they they always seem to to run into uh, financial trouble and uh apparently uh, Cartier Bresson had no sense of money at all and Kappa was very good at finding jobs, but he was not good at business in the in the in the management sense. But she was. He had a very precise mind. Uh, you could see the uh, the guy who was a very good chess player. He's a very good strategist. You can see that both in the way he places himself when he photographs and in the way he manages um, the boat as it were, in times of crisis. And especially after Kappa's death, he immediately stepped in. He was helped by George Roger, who was also quite good financially, and they managed to put the agency uh, back on track. Uh, the, the, the history of the agency um, involves not just uh, giving photographers much more um, many, many more rights, basically, on, on their own work, like to strengthen the position of photographer, of photographers in relationship to the publications and the editors, but also striking this difficult balance between doing ethical, almost artistic work and doing projects to make money, right? No, absolutely. They had to, they had to do business. They, uh, this is why um, uh, first uh, uh, Kappa and uh, John Morris created these uh, group uh, projects, uh, uh, people are people, uh, for instance, or uh, where where a bunch of Magnum photographers were going to different countries, or using the countries they were already working in for better financial ease. 
and photographing at the same time and uh, so publicizing themselves as an agency as a group uh business was a big part of it uh yeah it's a, it's a balance as you say absolutely yeah I, I, this summer I, uh, or this spring i saw an exhibit in amsterdam of magnum's commissioned projects for corporate um, that was very good yeah uh, the one at uh, at foam uh, right yeah yeah that was excellent you saw the magnum photographers taking pictures of steel factories for the steel factory and things like that uh, Absolutely. No, they did a lot of that. Uh, Cartier Bresson also did that. Uh, everybody did. And it was maybe not their best images, but they were, uh, they had to grease the machine. They had to make it work. In, in that sense, how, what, what is your, I, what is your um, impression of the evolution of Shim's politics? Because clearly in the thirties, when he gets to Paris, he gets sort of caught in, in or 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 um sucked into the the anti the left anti-fascist movement and very enthusiastically and committedly he is there to photograph all those first meetings of revolutionary artists and writers in Paris and then in, in Spain later um it's it's not clear from the biography I think whether he ever was a card-carrying member of the communist party and whether he distance himself from 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 the radical left after the war as many did or whether he stayed in that orbit do you have any sense of his political how he evolved politically? It, it is it is not easy i know uh, for sure that uh, he he came to photography through a guy named uh, rapaport who was uh, of the of the left the traditional left and then he, uh, like uh, Kappa, was a member of the AEAR, which is the Association of uh, Revolutionary Artists, um, Artists and Writers. And he exhibited several times with them uh, in Paris. Uh, what is less clear is how, if he was not a card-carrying member of the Communist Party, uh, did he ascend so fast in Rega? Because he starts as somebody who does an occasional photograph, but soon enough he's paired with uh, a number of different uh, reporters and he does entire stories. And then they sent him to um, Spain as a special correspondent and he persuades them to uh, take on Kappa and Taro as well. So where did that influence come from? Uh, and I think that mainly it was through his association with uh, George Soria, who was, uh, we shall we say, a hardcore Stalinist. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a, a bit of a strange couple, but they worked together all through the Civil War. Um, so I cannot uh, answer your question because I never found that card. So I don't know if he was actually uh, a member of the Communist Party. It'd be interesting it to see if, if, he, if he has an FBI file. Oh, uh, yeah, right. That would be interesting. I didn't think of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, definitely. I mean, during the war, he worked for the Allies. And he, this man who had, been, uh, who had not been accepted as a combatant because of his poor eyesight is then hired as a photography interpreter. And he was very vexed after World War, uh, after the Débarquement de Normandie, when he found out that he had been uh, uh, preparing the fake information for, you know, they 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 prepared fake the, information. The decoy, for right? German. Exactly, and it was a Brittany, uh, but no, it happened in Normandy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I think that um, uh, Israel is the time when he changed. He became more of a Zionist and less of a left-wing person, even though Israel in the, the 1950s is definitely not the Israel we know now. Um, it was a much more idealistic uh, country. Uh, it had a lot of the ideals of community that he cared for and culture. And um, yeah, it is not surprising uh, after his family was destroyed uh, by the Nazis that he would become a Zionist and sure. lose a, a sense of distance. Yeah. <coughs> well, thank you so much. I think I'd, I'll leave my questions here. This was really, really uh, nice to talk to you and, and open it up to the questions that other people might have. Dennis, do you have some questions from people? Sure. Sure. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I think we might begin with. Um, 
Um, Stephen, Stephen Hopkins has a question about the book itself. So if um, I'm going to call on, I'm going to unmute you, Stephen, if you'd like to ask your question. If not, I can ask it for you, but you have the ability to unmute now if you'd like. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, a fascinating uh, talk and, and interview. Um, my, my question really was um, about the extent to which you were able to find new images. I, I have the, the, the book, We Went Back, and I know that you were involved with that um, uh, book, which, which uh, was published uh, a number of years ago now. And I was wondering whether there had been uh, any, any new finds, any, any new um, images? Uh, yes, yes definitely. I, I had one luck, which is uh, at the time of COVID, I was allowed to go into the Magnum uh, New York offices where all of Shim's contact sheets are. And uh, the, the office was empty. And for uh, one year, uh, two or three days a week, I was able to look at his contact sheets the entirety of his career from 1932 to 1956. And I definitely found a lot of images that were lesser known. And another occasion where I found lesser known pictures was a few years back, I did a show on the children from uh, uh, Poland and Hungary uh, for a Hungarian gallery in uh, Budapest. And I also pulled out a lot of images that were not uh, reproduced in the database and they are now in the database. So uh, I think I, I've been able to add something hopefully to the knowledge we have of uh, Shim's images. Thank you for the question. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, just as a note, just if anybody wants to ask a question, please put it in the chat and I can direct you. Um, I can, you can ask the question yourself or I can ask it for you if you don't feel comfortable being on camera asking. But I will now uh, turn it over to um, Jim Smith has a question about the use of combat photography. So Jim, if you'd like to ask your question, you can uh, ask, do so now. Sure. Um, when I was uh, finishing up my book, Heroes to the End, about my 1972 tour in Vietnam, I had like moral questions about, should I publish body uh, KIA shots? And um, I wound up uh, deciding to publish six of them. And, you know, I was wondering, am I going to be haunted by these images uh, down the road? No, the answer was no. But my question is, um, did other combat photographers uh, have, uh, you know, similar uh, moral questions about publishing um, body shots? Well, uh, in the case of Shim, first of all, uh, they were not combat photographers. They were just photographers. They had no, uh, no weapons and they were not assigned uh, to troops, as it were. They were independent. Uh, Shim never photographed a dead person. Uh, uh, Gerda Taro did a number of images of dead children because she thought that they would be essential uh, to stir the opinion, to, to give money to Spain and to, to give arms to Spain, because the Francoists were helped uh, by both the Nazi and by Italy. Uh, you know, we all remember Guernica. So she thought that by showing the bodies of children of civilians in the morgue, uh, it would help the Spanish cause. Uh, I, so I don't think that they had um, this the uh, moral uh, quandary as to as to that they they were photographed for a cause they were not they did not think they were objective they were definitely siding when was with one side and uh, whatever they could do to uh, to prop the sides they would do it thank you sure thank you Jim. Um, okay, um, Jack has asked me, he, um, Jack has messaged me and said that he's in a little bit of a noisy environment, so he wants me to ask the question for him, and he's going to, he's asking, um, 
how did Kappa, Taro, and Chim's negative end up in the Mexican suitcase? Can we speak a little bit to that? I know there uh, yes, was some... we, can, uh, we can speak about this. So uh, Kappa, Taro, and Chim shared a, a lab uh, in uh, Rue Froide Vaux in Paris, where there is now a plaque commemorating uh, them. And uh, when, uh, when the uh, Germans invaded France, uh, Kappa and the others became aware that they had to save their pictures. So uh, they packed them in three cardboard boxes because the Mexican suitcase is not a suitcase. And uh, Fred Stein uh, went for the, the free zone in France on his bike, carrying these boxes. And he found a uh, diplomat who was uh, actually a, uh, uh, on the Frankish side that was uh, going back to Mexico and who had a, the diplomatic immunity. So he gave him uh, the boxes as a, for safeguarding. And then, so they traveled to Mexico, but they were lost uh, for decades. They were in a closet. Uh, and uh, Cornel Capas uh, had heard about the story and he started you know, putting out ads in the papers and trying to look for the suitcase. But then um, a uh, Mexican uh, cinematographer, uh, the Benjamin Traver, uh, announced that he had found these uh, images in his closet. And uh, the ICP sent uh, Trisha Ziff, who uh, has a lot of uh, Mexican links and lives part of the year in Mexico, to negotiate uh, the, uh, the return of the images to ICP. And it was a big, dispute because the Mexican state thought that the, uh, the US should not have these images and the ICP thought that they belonged with the rest of the archive of Kappa Shimentaro at ICP. So that's the story. <laughs> and then uh, well, there's a whole thing about the, uh, the images were uh, scanned with a special machine that was uh, built in Rochester uh, and the scans were then made into prints. And because in the uh, uh, over, I mean, inside the boxes, there was a sort of a, how do you call it? A quadrillage. Like a grid. A grid with all the captions. They were able to get a lot of information about each image and to know who had done this one or that one. So they were able to identify and to uh, attribute or reattribute images. So, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, this is uh, just a question from Susan um, about uh, about sort of the about the about possible exhibition of Chim's work. Susan, if you'd like to ask your question, I'm unmuting you now. She's not unmuted, I think. I can't hear her. Let's try it again. Now, can yes. you hear me? Yes, I can yes. hear you. Loud and clear. Are, are you planning any exhibitions in conjunction with the biography? Uh, yes, I actually, I just heard that I'm uh, going to co-curate two exhibitions in France. Uh, one of them is at the Rivesalt Memorial which is uh, a place uh, that is full of history because this is one of the, uh, of, the, of the camps where the Spanish Republicans were held after the war. And the other uh, exhibition will be at uh, Visa Polimage in Perpignan, and both will be in the summer of 2024. Uh, and there's, there is an exhibition currently at the Holocaust Museum in uh, Illinois, in Skokie, of a bad reputation, uh, and it's it's a very, it's an extract. It's a part of the exhibition that was at ICP, but it's different. It was also curated by Cynthia Young. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm going to go um, to Delicia. Um, who had a question on some uh, had a question on one of the things that we sort of offhandedly was brought up on an image on a particular image. Should be able to unmute now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes. Absolutely. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. This is so powerful to have a curator um, talk about stuff that I'm learning about in class in Spanish Civil War uh, visual culture. So this is really exciting. The nerdy side is out. But um, my question is about the images that um, Taro did of the children and then ask a double question if uh, Shim also has images of children that are not um, so graphic maybe as Taro. Um, since I'm doing kind of a project on children in the Spanish Civil War and would love to see um, the two sides of that representation the of the children and then um, kind of draw an analysis of that. So that's what I was curious about. Yeah, yes, Shim did a lot of images uh, of the civil population and the children in particular. One a very powerful series was done in the stadium of uh, Montjuic, where a lot, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, but this is a, a place where uh, a lot of refugees were brought and uh, he photographed uh, their, their daily life, their meals and so on. He photographed schools, he photographed hospitals, and he did a very uh, powerful series also in Minorca in the islands okay. because uh, uh, there's one image that's very well known where you see uh, the children with their, uh, their teacher uh, in a vault in a under, underground uh, trying to uh, protect themselves from bombs. So his, he, he was basically trying to show how life was continuing uh, for the civil population. What were the conditions? He was very interested in uh, in uh, documenting the civil population in general. Uh, and, and where can we find those images? Are they those? Are those in your book? Uh, some of them are in my book, but you can find them on the Magnum database. Okay. Uh, and what you do is you you have to uh, say you are a researcher, uh, write them, and ask to be. Uh, able to uh, get into the database and then you write some uh, some questions you you know for instance uh, Spain children civil life yeah that's the image I was talking oh, about okay yeah oh, that's and then you'll be able to access the images so okay. the, and, yeah thank um, you uh, Alicia many of, of Shim's images are also at the ICP website icp.org Yes. And okay. They're freely searchable. You search by keyword, yes. and then they'll they'll just pop up too. And this one, yeah, oh. that one is open. the The Magnum database um, has had to restrict access because they had some uh, some problems with uh, images by you know by some photographers, and uh, so they are very cautious about who they let in. But as a researcher, you shouldn't have any problem. Uh, okay. Perfect. Is there like um, a connection for being an NYU grad student, like uh, um, with accessibility? Yeah. Uh, I am sure. No, no. As long as you okay. are a researcher or a student, you could get it. There's also a book I did that's called uh, Children of War, but it's more about the 1948. That's not okay. Your, yeah. But the, okay. you, you should find plenty about the war in these two archives. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate sure. your time. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for a great question. Um, I'm going to call on now uh, Denise, um, who had a question about solidarity internationalism and weaponized photography. So you should be able to unmute now. If Please let me know if you're able to. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you Alba for organizing this actually this is very I mean amazing to also hosting the of course the dearest Carol Nagar here I have uh, I have two questions uh one is that is I'm wondering about what she thinks I mean about the uh the weaponized the concept of weaponized photography uh there's another one that here if this is a um the book by Joy Lawrence that's documented the um, the YPG fighters and the internationalists who went there against the fight against ISIS. And, and he has a chapter that is considered to put his camera next to the weapons and calling is a weaponized photography. Uh -huh. So since that you mentioned that they had a position, Kappa, Tara, and uh, Shim Seymour in the Spanish Civil War, are we considered, I mean, can we consider them also as an internationalist volunteer in a way? 
Oh yeah, I think they were uh, extremely close to the uh, to the Lincoln Brigade and the International Brigades. Uh, I don't know if you can call them weaponized photographers. I, it seems like it's applying a contemporary term to a historical period doesn't seem right to me. But uh, I, I think they were definitely uh, also volunteers. They were taking enormous risks. I mean, uh, uh, Taro left her life there uh, and Kappa also and Shim put themselves in uh, very difficult situations. So yes, I, I think they, they could be uh, considered close to the, to the international volunteers who uh, joined the war, yes. And, and my second question is about, I just saw that, that there was a, a series by Magnum Photography, I guess, a kind of a journal. It says Camera International. And uh, are you are you editor of the journal? No, no, not at all. <laughs> so have you ever kind of heard this at a kind of a journal name with the Camera International? No, I, I used to work for a journal, uh, a magazine called Camera International, but that was a long time ago. So I don't think it's... A, same thing you're talking about. Okay. Uh, okay sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Denise. Um, I'm going to call on now one of outstanding questions on from Marshall Mater. If you have a question, he has a question about one of the images or the Tresca photo. So if you'd like to ask that question now, Marshall, go ahead. Hello, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed. It's been really great. Uh, the Tereska photograph, absolutely, we talk about the photographer capturing an image and her right eye is so utterly in focus. I think that she's doing the capturing. She's capturing us. Yes. Do you think that photograph was done with lights? The reflection in the eye is completely circular. And um, sorry, I'm, could you answer that and I'll get back on track? But I, I, uh, I think uh, uh, Shim never used flash except in his uh, pictures of uh, Chinechita and Stalit. I believe that there was some fluorescent lighting in the classroom, and this is what creates uh, that effect. But uh, I, I don't think that he would have ever uh, thrown flash into the face of a, of a terrified child. Uh, that's not at all his personality. And you are totally right that, uh, you know, we are captured as, as uh, he has captured. There is a back and forth. There is a sort of recognition uh, in, and uh, she is, She's stuck in time. I mean, for her, the, the war never ended. Yeah, I, I, I came across the same picture in the UNESCO magazine that yes. was published in 1954, was it? Uh, sh shortly after the photographs were taken. And on the cover, you can see more on the left. You can see more of the drawing. Yes. So I'm sort of cheering on Tereska as Tereska the artist, because in the other bit that you can't see in this one, you can see more narrative there. I'm yes. not saying that she wasn't feeling the weight of her experience, but you can see figures within a, a sort of home area and then those white blobs coming down on the top of it, and then the billowing lines coming across and out of that. Uh, and I just wondered whether, is there more than one version of the photograph? Yeah, or has the photograph a, been cropped? There is, there is, it is this, this particular photograph is not cropped, but there are at least uh, 10 images uh, in that series. And some of them, you see a little more of the left of the image with the bomb, what, what are probably bombs falling. Uh, and I, I, don't, I didn't see figures really, but I, I see definitely the bombs uh, in those blobs. Yes. 
Sorry, could you just say again? How many in the series do you think? I, I think about I think about ten, but I would have to check. Right. Uh, okay. uh, because he did uh, several contact sheets on the whole on the school. He photographed the whole row of kids uh, with their drawings and the little um, uh, poster that the the teacher wrote. Toyas Dom, this is a home. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, he uh, focused on each kid and he stopped on Tereshka. She was at, all the way at the end of the row. And obviously something was going on and, uh, and they, uh, something was going on between them, obviously. Yeah, which is what makes the picture so powerful. Uh, you have to think that, that uh, Shim had recently uh, learned about his parents' death. So he was basically an orphan photographing traumatized people. So there was a connection, obviously. He was also traumatized. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for asking the question. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Marshall. Um, yeah, I think I, uh, please, this is, um, you know, we have a few more minutes. If anybody would like to ask a question, please put it in the chat now. Um, if not, um, I don't know if our chair would like to say anything. I think Denise has one more question. Oh, Denise, please, yes, go ahead. Uh, my question is then, is about, again, the, the journal, that magazine that you worked on, Camera International, which is different than, I just looked at it, there's another uh, magazine, Camera, as well. So, but which, uh, so you, do you have the story of that magazine? Because there's no kind of information on that. Uh, Camera Inter International was published in, uh, in Paris, but I was a correspondent for a couple of years, and that was in the uh, late 80s. And that's the one I know about. Uh, I, I don't know about a more recent, uh, but there was also another, which is a Swiss magazine, very prestigious, called Camera. And this one had mostly portfolios. It was uh, very beautifully printed. Was the Camera International had a tie with the Magnum photography or with any of the international uh, photojournalists? No, okay. no, I don't think so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from uh, from Deborah. Um, Deborah, you want to ask it, or should I ask it for you? I'll ask it. It's uh, it's whether you studied the work of Katy Orna and Ian Robinson, who are both two female photographers that um, worked in Spain during the war, and and uh, Ian Robinson shot photographs of the refugee camps as well to go along with uh, different press publications about that. Uh, what, I, I didn't understand the question. Oh, whether you, you've studied the work of Kathy Orna and Ione oh, Robinson. Uh, I, I know a, a little bit about Kathy Orna from uh, the exhibition I saw at the Jeu de Paume in Paris, uh, but um, uh, Shim was not in the refugee camps. Kappa was. Uh, he did, a, and also a, uh, there was a, a very good, um, I'm trying to remember his name, a Spanish photographer who lived in the in, in the Toulouse region, uh, Manuel, uh, something who wrote a book about the retirada, but uh, Shim did not do the camps. What he did was traveling with the 1600 uh, Mexican, uh, Mexican, uh, Spanish Republicans, uh, mostly from the world of culture on the SS Sinai, to Veracruz, and that's how he arrived in Mexico uh, in 1939. And then World War II started and he was stuck and he uh, emigrated to New York. So they have a, diff a bit of a different story, but uh, Katy Orna is a very good photographer. The other one, I don't know so well. Yeah, that, that's, uh, Katy Orna um, is being worked on now by a Spanish curator called Almudena. Rubio, who is who works at the um, International Institute for Social History in Amsterdam, uh -huh. and she just curated an exhibit in, in Spain about Catiornas unknown work together with that of Margaret Michaelis. A, oh yeah, Michaelis, uh, I know also. An Austrian. This institute is amazing. I worked with them on another project that I did on uh, uh, on communist Egyptian Jews uh, in the in uh, 
camps uh, during on the Nasser, and uh, they were incredibly nice about giving documents, not wanting any money except uh, just for scanning. And uh, yeah, they are great. They have an incredible archive. It's maybe the good final question is, is the question of the archive. You briefly mentioned that Mexico balked at the idea that the Mexican suitcase negatives would go, would go to New York City. Um, how, how do you feel about like Shem, Kappa, Taro were from Poland, Poland, Germany, Hungary, yeah, but, uh, lived and they, in they France. Were, exactly, they, but they were mostly based in Paris, so uh, you could claim that uh, Paris should have the photographs. What I really think is that uh, there, should, there should have been dupes of everything and that uh, a part of it should be in Mexico uh, because, you know, they, they all had links there too. It's very important. And maybe one in Spain and one in Paris, you know. I, I, my idea is that the archive should be shared. It shouldn't belong to any one institution. And is there any tension between Magnum still being a commercial agency um, and the idea of the archive as a publicly accessible resource for anybody to look at these photographs? Well, there, there is at the moment uh, the in the uh, French Magnum office, someone is working at uh, doing uh, everything so that the archive becomes accessible to researchers. Because it's really a, a very sad that one of the biggest European archives should not be. And uh, I would do everything I can to help in that, in that sense. Oh, that's wonderful. Just as a tip for those of you who are researching, um, we mentioned icp.org is, is a great resource for these images. Um, the IISH, the International Institute for Social History that I just mentioned, whose website is socialhistory.org, has an amazing archive of photography, Spanish, Spanish Civil War, but many other things, as Carol just mentioned. It's open. And, uh, they're, they're incredibly nice uh, with researchers. And then, and then to see these photographs as they were used, especially in the French press, uh, the the um, the Spanish yeah, National yeah. Library, which was, who's which is on on the internet as Gallica, G A L L I C A, has entire runs of Regard, for example, and uh, yeah. Humanité, and, and other other periodicals that publish these photographs, which are fully accessible, fully searchable, uh, fully downloadable. Um, you, you can download uh, you can download low res and if you want a higher res it, it's a very small fee and they, it's also very easy to research i've looked at the uh, vu ce soir uh, regard there it's it's great yeah. yeah and then in terms of spain in spain there's a lot available uh, but it's very dispersed so there's some national archives some local archives some autonomous ar autonomous region archives that's a little bit harder but the the, the french the, the benefits of the French centralist state once again come to the fore in the, yeah, idea of the National yeah. Library having everything, making everything available. And then the, there was, there was uh, the, the, I think, Imprimerie Nationale or Bibliothèque Historique had, uh, has uh, notebooks by Shim and Kappa. And it's really interesting because you could see that, that Shim was incredibly self critical and he cut up his contact sheets. Uh, like the contact sheet with the woman listening to the orator, there are maybe five images left, and we know there was much more because more was published in the press, but they are gone. Uh, he was a very critical, self-critical uh, in that sense. Yeah, a real, a real professional. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Carol. This this has been really wonderful. I, I really appreciate your taking this time uh, fairly late in the evening in oh, Paris to, to speak with fine. us. It's 11 p.m., uh, time for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, just to reiterate what Mark Wallam said at the beginning, our executive director, uh, we do this free of charge for the, for the general public, but we do very much appreciate donations, uh, without which we would not be able to do this work. We are a nonprofit 501c3. All your donations are tax deductible. Uh, the more generous you are, the more you can deduct from your taxes. And um, so we really appreciate your support of our work. Uh, do subscribe to the Volunteer Magazine. And um, we also, we're all, always open to, to suggestions for programming like this, topics you'd like to see addressed, books that we might have missed that you, whose authors you think will be interesting for us to speak with, anything like that, just write to info at alba-valve.org with your ideas and we'll take them into account. 
thanks again for listening. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, thank Carol. You. And yes, thank you all the question Sebastian askers. For your questions. And, and thank um, you for the like. <laughs> and our, our next event is uh, was just announced here. Um, it's Nora Guthrie um, it, in the framework of the assessment lecture series. Uh, Nora Guthrie and Peter Glazer will be speaking about Woody Guthrie and and uh, his connection to the Spanish Civil War and the musical legacy of the Spanish Civil War. It's, it's going to be amazing, I think. So that's on December 4th yeah. at what time again? Three o'clock, three o'clock, Sunday, December 4th, 3 p.m. 3 p.m. So we'll have to help you see you there. Yeah, Eastern time. Yeah. Thank you all. It was a pleasure. Great. Good to see everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.